Hello and welcome to the latest Lowy Institute event. My name is Jonathan Pryke, Director of the Lowy Institute's Pacific Islands Program. Let me begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land I speak to you today and acknowledging their elders past and present. It has been a busy few months for the Solomon Islands. The leaking of the draft text of a proposed Solomon Islands China Framework Agreement on Security in late March has sent alarm bells ringing across the Western world. Facing domestic and international pressure, Rather than backing down, the Sogavare government rushed to sign the agreement just a few weeks later, potentially setting Solomon Islands onto a course that could upend the security and geopolitical landscape in the Pacific. Concern has been particularly acute in Australia, where these developments have crashed into a hotly contested federal election campaign that some have tried to frame around the issues of national security, a topic my colleague Richard McGregor discussed in, a de in detail in another Lowy Institute event today. There has never been a time in recent history when the Pacific has factored so heavily in an Australian election campaign, with the narrative descending to who has dropped the ball and to red lines, and with many security analysts fearing that Solomon Islands is now locked into a trajectory of eventually hosting a Chinese military base, a prospect that would fundamentally change the way Australia looks at its own defence and security. But through all of this noise, what does the Solomon Islands China security agreement really mean for Solomon Islands and the region? How is it being perceived in Solomon Islands? What were the drivers behind Sogavare government signing the deal? And what are China's ambitions in Solomon Islands and beyond in the broader Pacific? To try and answer all these questions and more, I am joined by a stellar panel of experts on Solomon Islands. Dorothy Wickham is a highly experienced media and communications specialist with an in-depth understanding of Pacific Island politics, cultures, and effective communication practices. Dorothy was a long-standing host of what was Ramsey's national radio talkback program, Talking Truth, and managing editor of the One News Television. Founding editor of social media site Melanesia News Network and coordinator of Sea Change Solomon Islands. Dorothy is a trusted voice in Solomon Islands and the Pacific. Dorothy, it's great to see you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Next is James Batley. James is a distinguished policy fellow at the Department of Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. James joined ANU following a distinguished career at DFAT where, where the, his career postings highlights included postings to Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu and Indonesia, as well as head of mission in Timor-Leste and Fiji. Most importantly, James was High Commissioner to Solomon Islands from 1997 to 1999 and returned as coordinator of the Regional Assistance Mission to Solomon Islands from 2004 to 2006. James finished his career at DFAT as a Deputy Secretary. James, thanks for being here. Hi, Jonathan. And finally, we have Graham Smith. Graham is a fellow at the ANU's Department of Pacific Affairs and is Australia's leading expert on China's engagement in the Pacific Islands. He has a particular focus on how Chinese infrastructure contractors adapt and influence the business and political environment in Pacific Island states, a subject quite pertinent to, for today's discussion. Graham also hosts the award-winning Little Red podcast with former NPR and BBC journalist Louisa Lim which explores Beijing, China beyond the Beijing Beltway. Graham, hello there. Good to see you, Jono. All right, Dorothy, I would like to get started by asking a simple but big question of you. How are things on the ground in Honiara? And what are the major concerns or opportunities people are sharing with you about this deal? I think there's a sense of uh, people are fed up with it now and they're tired and they want to move on with the subject. Uh, but I, as you know, the overseas media is still very much covering uh, this issue, and which of course some landers see, um, and that's the benefits of having um, uh, internet and social media. So uh, the discussion is still ongoing. Uh, you see people commenting on uh, Prime Minister Sogovare's comments on the floor of Parliament in regards to this uh, security uh, treaty. So it's an ongoing subject. Thanks, Dorothy. Uh, James, this story has obviously been big news in Australia. What's got people so animated? Is this all being overblown and inflamed by the election? Or should we be genuinely concerned about recent developments? I think it's a, it's a genuinely significant and important development in terms of the way that Australia has always uh, looked out into its immediate region. Uh, it's always been a really important element uh, of Australian policy uh, to, or perhaps a better way to, to better word to use is it's been a, an ongoing anxiety of successive Australian governments 
uh, about the possibility of hostile powers or potentially hostile powers establishing themselves uh, in countries and territories uh, that, um, that border on Australia. That's, a, that's an anxiety that goes back, in fact, to before Australia became a country, uh, to before federation. So I think uh, this agreement, even though it's, as we, I guess we should agree, it's not necessarily an agreement to establish a base, but uh, it may provide uh, grounds for that. It seems to me, the other thing that seems to me is that even though uh, China has established some form of security uh, cooperation with a number of countries in the Pacific over the past decade or so, this agreement seems to me to be qualitatively different uh, in terms of its scope, its open-ended nature. Uh, so I think uh, the Australian government, uh, I, I think its concern is, is well-founded. But James, just a, a follow-up. I mean, you, you raised that there are unique elements of this deal, uh, such as you know the the policing arrangements and the agreements for um, for to, on the request of Solomon Islands government for Chinese forces to come and protect Chinese citizens and and assets. Um, but does this logically lead us to a base? I mean, it, does, it seems like there, it, it's still a mental stretch to to see that that's the next step. I mean, there, there surely must be many more steps. In, in between and many more steps that the Solomon Islands government would have have still been the driver's seat on? Uh, in and of itself, not necessarily. There's a couple of questions there, though. One is, uh, you know, what what might a base look like? And in, in some respects, this, this base discussion is a bit misleading because it's, I, I think the broader issue is access, um, not necessarily a base. Uh, but I think also we need to see this agreement in the broader context of a pattern of Chinese behaviour over the last few years. Uh, and I think it's that pattern of behaviour that, um, that leads me and I think leads a lot of other people to conclude that um, the intention of this agreement is not simply... Uh, on the part of China to help Solomon Islands domestically with its own security issues, that there is a broader uh, geostrategic agenda at work, um, and indeed one that is that is designed uh, to uh, undermine what we might think of as Western interests in this part of the world. I, I do think there has been a debate uh, in. Um, both government circles and, and academic circles, et cetera, about what exactly China's intentions are in this part of the world. But I think this agreement has given us, a, uh, those of us that don't have access to confidential government information, a much better steer about, about what China might be up to. Probably Graham is better qualified to, to comment on that though. Well, that's exactly where I wanted us to lead next. Uh, but yes, it's, it's certainly hard for those who've talked about the China's benign interests in, uh, in the Pacific to, to still mount that argument. But Graham, you and I have been talking about China's interests in the Pacific for the better part of a decade. And you know, I know you've been looking at it for even longer than that. Um, there's been, there has been a lot of talk about what this deal could mean for Australia. But what does this deal mean for China? What is China? What are China's ambitions in Solomon Islands and the broader Pacific? And a final question, I mean, back to, to focus on your research topic here is how, how does China build that influence? Like what are the levers that it is using in a place like Solomon Islands um, to, to try and build that influence and, and achieve its goals? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to say on the first question of what their ambitions are in the South Pacific because we're, uh, unlike Solomon's, the Chinese government doesn't leak much. So we're unlikely to see a document uh, framing out exactly what their ambitions are. And it is a long way from, you know, their shipping lanes and, and things of commercial interest to them. So, you know, compared to Djibouti, compared to Reem um, in uh, Cambodia, it's not the top of their list um, for places to build a base. And I, I absolutely agree with James' scepticism there. But as he says, it's about access. It's, you know, about can you dock your ships there? Can you sort of uh, have the sort of support you need to uh, be a global Navy? Because that's the ambition is 
eventually they want a navy that has similar prestige to that of the United States. And you don't have that sort of prestige if you don't, uh, you know, have places at the very least rather than bases. Um, in terms of the levers, uh, which is a really interesting question, um, the levers for a long time in the Pacific have been um, companies, generally state-owned companies, um, with the exception of Huawei, which is a nominally private company. But these state-linked companies are, are probably the ones to watch if you're looking at something approaching that red line of a base. And, and as James alluded to, this whole question of red lines is a little bit dubious because of, as Obama discovered, um, you know, drawing a red line and then not acting on it is, uh, you know, catastrophic for a, 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 your credibility as a global power. Um, but in, in this case, if you look at the uh, actors who are leading China's push in the Pacific, they're the same ones you see in Djibouti. They're the same companies you see in Cambodia. Um, it's these big Chinese companies such as CCECC, China Harbor, um, and something approaching a base would be great for them because it's work. It's a, it's a commercial contract um, and it's something that they have people on the ground to, uh, to promote. So, you know, whereas they might not be uh, briefed in on national security meetings and so forth, um, they know very well what the intent is from the top and they know responding to signals um, makes them more likely to get the nod on projects. Yeah, we, we always, we, we, we debate what China's ambitions are in the Pacific over and over and over. And as you say, we're never going to get the, the leaked strategy, but, you know, it could be natural resources, it could be access, it could be basing, it could be political influence, it could be UN votes, it could be countering Taiwan, uh, it could be commercial interests, it could be, yeah, private, private sector interests, it could be, you know, getting a contract and making money, or it could be all of the above. I'm of the mind that it's all of the above. You know, China's so big. There are ambitions that, that span, the, span the spectrum. So, um, and all of them, I think, are coming to play in Solomon Islands right now. Dorothy, I wanted to come back to you here. There's clearly been a Chinese presence in Solomon Islands long before 2019. But what does the Chinese presence look like today in Solomon Islands? And how are the Chinese viewed in, in Honiara? I know that's a loaded question because there are a lot of varying perspectives. But how, how do people talk to you about China in, in Solomons? Is a general consensus that um, they've, they've moved in and they moved in fast and big. Uh, their aid, as you know, here is a very uh, physical, you can actually see and touch. And for the last 40 years, I think we've, we've not had much uh, big infrastructure projects, especially if you, you're looking at um, donor assistance, apart from uh, New Zealand's big, huge uh, work in the Western province with the International Airport and also the road from uh, Munda to Noro, which are two big, huge projects that uh, people in the rural area can see and uh, actually uh, say, yes, this is, this is aid coming from a particular country. And I think this is where Australia, um, I wouldn't use the term fail, but I think the misunderstanding uh, of a lot of average Solomon Islanders is that aid has to look like a concrete building, has to be a bridge, has to be a wharf, I think Australian aid, uh, as, as uh, we all know, has focused a lot on governance. And uh, as the work with Ramsey has always been in the background, uh, strengthening uh, uh, government institutions, um, especially in terms of our finance, debt collecting, uh, taxation, uh, policing. And it, it's, a, it, it's the kind of aid that uh, if, you, if you talk to an average Solomon Islander, they wonder where all the money goes and also you know, that term boomerang aid, that's also one that is always referred to when they talk about Australian aid. So I think it's also a language thing and also um, an understanding of how, how, how aid works. And I think that's where we, we have that issue in the Solomon that the Solomon Islanders don't appreciate how much we get out of Australia. I think, but one of the biggest pluses for Australia over the last few years is the seasonal workers scheme. That ordinary Solomon Islanders feel the effect, they see it, they see the benefits in their neighbours, somebody in their village, somebody they're related to. So that, that's, a, that's a, a, a support that Australia, I think, should use, leverage, because I think that's where um, I have said uh, social interaction between our countries uh, needs to be enhanced, I think. Um, we, we've always... I think taken for granted Australia's presence in this country. And I think 
that needs to be worked on. And maybe, um, uh, as I've said before, narratives need to change and maybe focus. Uh, it's something that uh, the Australian government and people will need to relook and uh, maybe adjust. Jonathan. Thanks, Dorothy. Thanks, Dorothy. I mean, you're, you're preaching, I think, to the choir on labor mobility in this panel, because I think we all agree that it's definitely a, a really important initiative to expand and to that can really underpin, I think, future relations in the Pacific. Um, you know, James, coming back to you here, talk about Australian aid. You've, of course, had a lot to do with Australian aid over, over many years in Solomons. Um, what do you think about Dorothy's assessment here? I mean, uh, you know, governance versus infrastructure, the flag flying and, you know, being present and shown to have like big, these big flagship infrastructure initiatives, as opposed to like, you know, the nuts and bolts of working on systems of government. Is there, should Australia be recalibrating, doing a bit more in that space? Um, or is, or should we also be concerned about the longer term here about, uh, you know, the white elephant projects that do, you know, we do see littered around, not just Pacific, but around um, the rest, around the entire region. Yeah, I, I think Dorothy certainly put her finger on uh, a broader issue in the in the relationship between Solomon Islands and Australia. I think for a very long time it's been very narrowly based on government to government relations. There's not, for instance, there's not a lot of trade between Solomon Islands and Australia, so there isn't a strong business lobby uh, that's got a stake in the relationship. Um, and there's a tiny Solomon Islands community in Australia. So again, uh, that, that the people to people links um, are not nearly as strong as they could be. Now with, I, I agree with the labor mobility, that is building a, a, a much stronger foundation for the relationship. It's broadening that relationship out. So I think looking in the medium and longer term, that's going to be a really, a really important part of of relations. If we're thinking about the aid program uh, specifically, it's clear that Australia is already uh, making moves to, to, uh, to broaden the focus of its work. So I think I saw a, an announcement just in the last few days of Australia being part of a group of donors involved in the major uh, Bina Harbour development in Malaita. Of course, Australia has been uh, helping with the uh, Tino River Hydro project as well. These are major uh, national projects. I do think, Dorothy, the uh, the Japanese government might be feeling a bit um, uh, <laughs> that that you, you've neglected their their really big contribution uh, in the infrastructure area over the years, and I I think. Perhaps in the past, Australia has seen that um, countries like Japan or organisations like the Asian Development Bank have looked after the infrastructure side of development, whereas Australia has really focused on strengthening government institutions. I think for Australia, it's always been very important that um, to support uh, government institutions in Solomon Islands Having said that, I think Australia has learned a lot of lessons over the course of many years uh, in understanding that, you know, just, just strengthening central government institutions based in Honiara doesn't necessarily have a kind of trickle out impact on the lives of Solomon Islanders, the 80% of Solomon Islanders that are living uh, in villages right across the country. Uh, I think that's one of the real uh, take home messages of the Ramsey period, you know, for all the good that Ramsey did, I think, in restoring law and order and restoring government finances. But that, that impact at the grassroots level, I think, is something that um, I, I know that Australian uh, policymakers and planners um, wrestle with that question and are asking themselves, you know, how do we have that, that broader impact? Um, on the lives of, of ordinary Solomon Islanders. So to sum all that up, yes, I think we can see some evolution in the way Australia is, is thinking about uh, these approaches uh, in Solomons. Thanks, James. Uh, now, Dorothy, there is one, uh, as James alluded to, there is one missing pillar here with Australia's relationship in Solomon Islands, and that is the commercial one. 
Uh, but of course, China has extremely strong commercial ties in, in Solomon Islands. How does uh, that look on the ground? Um, you know, I, I've been to Honiara many times and you see all the trade stores, of, of course, but there's, but are we seeing more business interests coming in after 2019? I think that, that, that is a, um, an area that really, really needs to be addressed uh, by, by the government and also its donor partners. I think that the trade between Solomon Islands and Australia is a difficult one for a country like us. Uh, meeting the requirements for exports into Australia, it's quite difficult. And also volume, I think volume is, is one key and um, access to the to markets to getting uh, wherever it is located to a port. And as you know, we only have two international ports here, seaports, which is Noro and Honiara. And then the rest of the country has to feed into these two ports. So it's, 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 a, it's a difficult thing, I think. Uh, but it's one that's maybe um, something that can be dis discussed. I mean, if you have the right people sitting in the right place, talking and facilitating um, trade, I think it, it can be done. But of course, we sit here in Somalia and we always seeing announcement of uh, Taro women put it to Australia, cassava to um, uh, uh, New Zealand. And it, it's, a, it's a bitter pill to swallow because there's, as you know, uh, every Solomon Islander is a, is a landowner, owns land. And I think that's the biggest uh, resource that we have um, that we can claim. A and uh, how to utilize that and benefit from it. I think that's, that's the key. Some, somebody um, said to me, I think it was the former CEO of the uh, Development Bank of Solomon Islands, Mr. Tukana Bovoro. He said, the, the willingness to work, the work ethic to work, if it, you're talking agriculture, fisheries, we have it here in the Solomons, but it's, uh, it's also the financial um, uh, education that is very much lacking on the ground. And I think those are the areas that maybe um, Australia could look at. Uh, and help facilitate through Australian aid funded projects like Strong Business. They've done done quite uh, good work uh, in that regard over the last uh, few years that Strong Business has been established in, in the Solomons, helping uh, uh, ecotourism and other businesses uh, strengthen um, their foundations. But I, I want to uh, speak on what uh, James was saying. I, I agree that... Uh, Australia has focused on the nuts and bolts and which is the governance issues. But, but then there's that, I always use this argument, how, how can you um, educate Solomon Islanders on what it means to have a good government system, a good governance, when uh, education is lacking on the ground? You know? And I, that's why I keep saying over and over again in every platform that, that I can use it, that education is our key. And of course, that follows you know, health. Health is the next one. And I, I think this is where one area where maybe Australia can boost its support uh, into Solomons. We need, we really need funding, pushing 100%, 110% education. I think that that would be the key. I mean, as you know, education uh, comes, everything else follows. You don't really have to work too hard uh, to talk uh, issues of uh, crime prevention, issues of governance, corruption, when you have an educated society who understands these issues. And if you, if you look at Fiji, I think Fiji is a good example of that. On average, uh, education is, is free for them. And uh, which means on average, you have a pretty well-educated society uh, who is aware and understands issues of governance. And I think that that's where uh, I really feel strongly that um, if uh, Australia and New Zealand are to help uh, here, and also that could be part of this people to people um, Mm, enhancing of uh, relationships between um, Australia and the Solomons is through education as well. Could I come in there? Could I come in there, though, Jonathan? I mean, I, James, jump in. I, I do think this is one of the challenges that Australia faces because there are so many demands and expectations. And Australia has very significant uh, aid programs in both education and health in, in Solomon Islands. Um, alongside the work in the economic side, strong in government, alongside the, uh, the security work, the policing support uh, and, and general governance support. So, I mean, that is there. Uh, but as I say, I think there are so many demands that 
inevitably choices have to be made. Um, there are, we have Solomon Islands PhD students in Australia. Those are very expensive um, uh, scholarships. Of course, they produce high quality scholars, but then that's the trade-off perhaps at the primary education end of the equation. So, I mean, I just think governments on both sides need to keep talking about those issues to get the balance right. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not easy. Clearly a lot more we can discuss on, on the aid fronts and clearly a lot of unfinished business for, for the Australian aid program. Um, but before we jump away from the, and of course, at Australian aid is dwarfs what China has been providing since 2019 in the aid space and looks like set to continue. But I do want to touch back, Graham, with you on China's commercial interests in Solomon's. And, you know, I use this commercial interest term very broadly in that, you know, you have the trade stores and I don't think that the Chinese sitting in their uh, tennis umpire chairs in the corner, bossing around the local staff, uh, really help build influence in the country. But then you also have the state and enterprise, you have private sector investment, you have the logging ind industry, uh, and of course you have the, the major SOEs you touched on earlier, that it, and you see these MO, MOUs coming out every almost every week now talking about creating an airline industry in the Solomons or, or leasing the, Tula, the island of Tulagi. And, you know, could you kind of unpack that a bit for us? Like, how does, how does China use this commer these broad and, like, and loosely connected commercial interests to, to exert its influence in a place like Solomons? Yeah, um, I mean, one thing, a helpful starting place is probably the Belt and Road Initiative and how they define that. So they have this thing called the five connectivities, which covers a whole, um, well, basically five areas that they're looking to uh, exert influence in. And one of them actually is the shopkeepers. Um, it comes under people to people relations. And that's been a huge problem from them in the past. I mean, they had a report after the 2006 riots where they said, we've got to do something to stop these people leaving our shores because they're destroying China's reputation. You know, they're actually talking about stopping them going to Solomon's at the Chinese border because their quality was too low and we shouldn't let them out of the country. Um, and they're costing us so much because they cause all these riots and the, the, the um, agency, the overseas, um, Chinese, um, the overseas Chinese Affairs Office, um, blamed them for the rights in 2006. Said, look, these guys brought it on themselves because they, they're such trash. Um, now, obviously, this group didn't really welcome the switch. Um, when I talked to them in 2009, they were very much, no, no, we're really happy for them to stay with Taiwan because if they switch, there'll be more competition, there'll be more Chinese businesses coming in, and it's going to be bad for our business, um, which is, of course, what has happened. Um, so at the top level, you have these big companies. Um, CCECC is really leading the way in Solomons. Uh, they basically pitched the switch um, to Sogavari and his entourage. Um, you also have China Harbour, which is a really um, significant state-owned enterprise. So the thing about these companies is they're so big, they actually outrank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So in terms of deciding what happens on the ground in Solomons, you would assume the ambassador has a leading role. Not really. Um, he has to listen to these companies because they're more powerful than he is in a political sense, not just an economic sense. Um, so they, they are really the ones to watch in terms of what happens in the future um, in China. And then you have this other really interesting category that what you might call the uh, ideas entrepreneurs like China Sam, um, who kind of pop up and are behind a lot of these MOUs and a lot of these you know, funny things that get leaked. Um, but if you, China Sam kind of sounds like a joke because of the name, but if you look at their subsidiaries, they're exactly the kind of entities you would be looking to, to build a base abroad. Um, they are connected to companies that have the license to sell, for example, weapons abroad, um, which definitely isn't the case for, for many companies. Um, so it, it's an interesting, if you like, melange of, of Chinese commercial actors. Um, but the thing they have in common is, they have skin in the game and they're looking to promote their own interests. And these days, because of the BRI, they're looking to um, align those interests with um, signals from the top. Thanks, Graham. I mean, we may laugh at all these MOUs that just, you know, because we know these countries seem farcical. I remember the one in Western Province in Daru in Papua New Guinea for a major fishing uh, re refinery, which, you know, there's no, there's no tuna in that part of the country. And also Daru has major TV issues. 
But um, you know, but all China needs is for one of these to stick, right? And to, to get interest from Beijing and someone to buy it and the money to flow. And you know, the, the person pitching gets, gets their cut and, uh, but, and it can upend the whole, the whole uh, fr like strategic framework in the Pacific. So um, they, are, they are still very important to watch. Uh, James, I'd like to zoom out again and uh, focus again on the Australia-Solomon Islands relationship. Now we talked about the aid the aid side of things, which of course has been a really dominant part of this relationship. But I was hoping you could help us unpack some of the complicated history of Australia's engagement with Solomons in the last two decades and help us help to explain what, our, what Australia's long-term interests are in Solomons. Yeah, I, I was thinking back to when I uh, went to Honiara as High Commissioner, which was quite a long time ago now in, uh, in 1997, and I have to say back then, uh, I remember doing my rounds of uh, government departments in Canberra before I left for that posting. And there was really, I have to say at the time, very little knowledge and understanding about Solomon Islands. Uh, at that time, our aid program with Solomons was very small, um, something in the order of $12 million a year, I think. It was, it was pretty much a, I think, a neglected uh, relationship. I think it started to become, to come into focus over the course of the Bougainville crisis uh, when we had, there was those spillover effects uh, of Bougainville into Solomons and also Solomons became, a, in a sense, a, a backdoor for humanitarian supplies and for people to move in and out of Bougainville. And uh, I think from a Canberra perspective, that's, that's when um, uh, Solomon started to come into focus. And it underlines one of the, I think, the, the key interests that Australia has. It is that, um, it is that, that relationship between uh, Solomons and Bougainville and Papua New Guinea more generally, because of course that border between Papua New Guinea and Solomons is a is an artificial colonial creation. Um, I guess what what really brought Solomons, of course, to attention uh, in Canberra was the outbreak of the of the tensions, uh, the the um, or the, the called the ethnic tensions. Uh, in, uh, I guess, 1999 um, through to 2003. Uh, this is the period where you saw the, uh, the rise of uh, armed militant factions based in Guadalcanal and, and, uh, and a response from uh, Malaitan factions uh, and really the, the disarming of the police force uh, so that the, the, the state lost the monopoly on, uh, on violence. And there was a serious breakdown in law and order and in the effectiveness of government. And, and this certainly grabbed the attention of the Australian government and to cut a long story short, uh, led to, to the start of Ramsey in 2003. But I guess it took the Australian government quite a bit of internal um, uh, thinking and debate to move into that very assertive, um, that strong leadership position that it took in Ramsey. Uh, for I think for a long time, Australia was trying to support the, the police in Solomons. It was trying to support uh, non-government organizations like the Red Cross to, to help manage the, this period of the tensions. But it was a real sea change in Australia's approach in the middle of 2003 when, when Ramsey uh, was deployed in response to a request from the, the Prime Minister at the time. So, of course, that wasn't Australia by itself, it was Australia and other members of the Pacific Island Forum, but the, the, um, the great bulk of personnel were Australians, whether that's military, police or civilians. And in, the, in a space of a very short period of time, um, you had hundreds uh, of uh, Australian personnel uh, rotating in and out of Solomon Islands, interacting with, meeting with Solomon Islanders, working in all different parts of the country. Uh, and again, from a, from a Canberra point of view, uh, quite quickly, Solomons became a major government priority 
um, you know, and, and I guess the overall objective was: can we help to um, to res firstly to bring about um, peace between these warring factions, to disarm those militant groups, to restore law and order, but then to restore the uh, the the functioning of the efficient and effective functioning of government. And I, again, that's I think addresses another significant Australian interest. Uh, in Solomon Islands and in the Pacific Islands more broadly. Um, I think Australia has always felt that instability uh, or vulnerability there, or fragility, there's a range of words we might use, in the region does directly affect Australia's national interests. Uh, it does so because it means that uh, the governments in the region themselves uh, could be vulnerable to uh, to organised criminal groups, could be vulnerable to, uh, or, or don't have the capacity to respond to natural disasters, um, don't have the capacity to serve their own, service their own populations in ways that would uh, raise living standards and reduce disease, um, child mortality, all of that sort of thing. So I think that was certainly the focus of Australia's interest uh, around uh, 2003, the Prime Minister at the time, John Howard, used to say one of the, one of the justifications that he put forward uh, in, in talking about Ramsey to the Australian Parliament was that if Solomon Islands did become a, a failed state at the time, then perhaps it could become a, a haven for international terrorists. I guess we need to think that this was in the context of the war on terror. It's only a short time after 9-11. But if you think back to 2003, and I'll stop talking in a minute, um, no one back in 2003 was thinking about China. Um, it really wasn't part of the calculation. Of course, Solomon's at the time had relations with Taiwan, um, and that, that contest between China and Taiwan had been simmering for a number of years in the Pacific, but but that it doesn't seem to me was a real driver uh, of of Australian policy um, at the time. So I think I, I hope that very long answer um, <laughs> responds to your your question about Australian interests in Solomon's. Let me just summarise that by saying I think in a sense Australia does feel a responsibility given that it is a rich developed country in a neighborhood of poorer developing states. And that in that sense, it does have, it, it feels this responsibility to assist with development. Um, but that also serves Australia's, uh, Australia's own national interests. Thank you, James. Uh I, th I think it's really important to remind people that our interests in Solomon's predate China and go far beyond China and will continue to into the future. Mm -hmm. And in no country, there's very, the only other country I can think of was Timor-Leste where Australia has had such an interventionist role in a country and nation, in the nation building effort. And so, you know, whilst Australians may not think about Solomon Islands every day, I guarantee many people in Solomon Islands do think about Australia every day and have been, have had direct exposure to Australians in various capacities in their country. Um, and whilst Ramsey was a success, you know, James, you and I were both, and Dorothy, I'm sure you were there as well, were all at the end of Ramsey celebrations in 2017. And it was a really cathartic moment, it felt, for, for, for Solomon Islands, for, for the region more broadly, and for Australia, um, and for Sogavare, who we'll come back and talk, to about, talk about in a moment. Um, but it certainly does mean that there must be some really complicated emotions about Australia in Solomon Islands. I mean, Dorothy, what can you tell us? Can you tell us a bit more about that? Like, how how is Australia viewed? I mean, I know there's varying opinions, but there must be a range of perspectives in the community. And are they at all different from views in Parliament? I, I think you you're right in saying that Ramsey played a huge role in uh, uh, giving access to. To Australians, to um, people in our rural areas, and vice versa, uh, people in our rural areas having personal contact 
um, not only with Australians, but you had the New Zealanders, the Fijians, the Tongans, every single Forum Island country member. And, and because of their postings into some of the most remote parts of the country, it, it was a special time. And mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of Somali elders still maintain that those re personal relationships they've had with uh, uh, Ramsey, whether it's military, police, or um, uh, consultants who came in and out of, of the Solomons during that period. And I, I think that's, uh, I think where Australia basically dropped the ball was when they pulled out uh, from Ramsey or closed it down would, uh, would be the right term. Um, there was that sense of a gap uh, left. Uh, it was funny because during that, uh, period of Ramsey, it wasn't always 100% uh, a good relationship. There were times we'd had, you know, parliamentarians ranting in parliament about uh, Australia and Australia pushing uh, its power around here. And then uh, as we went towards closer to the time they were leaving, uh, Solomon Aldis uh, didn't realize that the, the withdrawal was, um, was done in such a way um, that you just started to see less and less of Australian police officers on the road and little posts in the rural areas started to close down and there were a lot of personal farewells between people who had become friends and it just slowly wound itself down. I think I think the Ramsey exit was done very well. So well that Saul Manalis just didn't realize that it was up, you know, Ramsey was finished. And <laughs> uh, even though it, it, it was a long time, it, people felt like it was just yesterday, you know, but, but I think, I think that that that's a, a lesson that maybe Australian journalists can relook or uh, review and look back on and and try and rebuild this 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 relationship. I think we've gone through a few weeks of us really um, scrutinizing and really looking at our relationship with Australia. And I think uh, some journalists, I, I I seem to notice on social media there's a there's a a slight tilt towards uh, Solomon Allen as being more appreciative of what Australia is doing. And you see it more coming out more in terms of um, when there's a post or there's a release on um, Solomon Allen is going out to, to work in Australia. And that's when you see Solomon Allen is actually acknowledge and say, yes, um, we have, have benefited from Australia's assistance. Despite whatever it is, issues we have uh, with Australia as a long-term partner and a neighbor, and as you know, the unfortunate <laughs> use of the term backyard has been mm. taken totally out of text here now. It just over the last, you know, 24 hours, it's just gone all over the place with the prime minister um, using and using it in a rant in parliament. And it's just social media commentary has just been hilarious. I think James has been following that. No, <laughs> I avoid social media. <laughs> Dorothy, I, I have been following the social media over the last 24 hours, following so Prime Minister Sogavare's um, uh, yeah, colourful language in Parliament yesterday. I I won't, we won't repeat the language here, but I encourage people to go have a look if they're interested in seeing the sorts of narratives we're hearing about Australia and Australian narrative, uh, language used about Solomon's in, in Solomon's Parliament. Of course, uh, one of the man, the man at the centre of all of this is one who is prone to, to um, a good speech in Parliament. Uh, that is Prime Minister uh, Manasse Sogavare, who has been a dominant force in Solomon Islands politics for two decades. Graham, you famously or infamously uh, got him on the Little Red podcast in 2019, talking about the upcoming swap. Um, what did you make of the man and what do you think drove him to signing this deal? Look, uh, Dorothy and James both know Manasse much better than, uh, than I do, um, but obviously he's a very uh, charismatic, a very magnetic personality. Um, he's certainly... Uh, almost has a messianic presence about him and a great self-confidence. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you go back and listen to the show, um, it's clear even at the, uh, the time, um, a, a lot of his um, attraction to China was about the feeling that uh, Australia at times um, pushed them around, um, particularly with regards to Taiwan. Uh, that was sort of the first thing he nominated is that, they had this policing agreement that they'd signed with Taiwan. They were about to send the police to Taiwan and Australia came in and said, no, no, that's, uh, that's not for Taiwan. That's our business. At least according to him, that's how it went. Um, so, so, yeah, I, uh, one thing I would like to note, and I'm sure um, the other two know this better, is you hear this 
a sort of suggestion that um, he's autocratic because China's in the picture. Um, if you look at his previous three terms, autocratic is not new. <laughs> it, um, it pops up every time he's prime minister. Um, so I don't know you can necessarily pin Sogavari's personality change, as it might seem to some people, um, on China. This seems to happen every time. Thanks, thanks, Graham. I mean, James, you've probably had more to do with Sogabare over the years than any Australian official. What do you think makes him tick? Like, what, what do we need to know about Sogabare to better understand his decision making? Wow. Well, um, yeah, I, I think I first came across him when um, he was the finance minister in the government in the late 1990s. Um, but I think... Um, the Prime Minister is a, is a very nationalistic um, man. He's extremely proud to lead his country. Um, he can be a very intense uh, person. I, I think, you know, the sort of rhetoric that he uses in Parliament, I've had to say to a lot of people in Australia, um, you know, since this is characteristic of, of Prime Minister Sogavari's style, um, so you need to, to, to listen to that sort of rhetoric or to read those words in that broader context. Um, I think a lot of people have found it difficult to get close to him in a personal sense, so they find him quite guarded um, and with a, a fairly closed or close circle of advisors uh, around him. Um, you know, he's, he's lost, he's been Prime Minister four times, but he's also, he's lost power a number of times as well uh, in motions of no confidence. So he doesn't, um, he's clearly got enormous political skills. I mean, and he's the preeminent political leader, I think, of his generation. Um, but perhaps not always capable of, of keeping everybody on the, on the boat at the same time. Thanks, James. Um, Dorothy, one of the uh, talk about the closed group uh, the, around the prime minister. One of the frustrations of this deal that I think you've voiced is the secrecy that surrounded it. I mean, with the final text is still being hidden from the public and we're unlikely to see it. Uh, you, you have written for The Guardian about your frustrations with the transparency of the Sogavare government. I mean, would you mind expanding on this point a bit? Yeah, I, I think like James said, this is this is not uh, Sogovare as a result of China, and I totally agree with that. Um, this is Sogovare, basically, and that that's how he he speaks, and that's his political style, you know. And mm -hmm. we are used to him. Um, I, I I like James. Uh, first met him when he was a minister of finance, and I was just a, you know young cadet, and I travelled down to the border as part of the Western Province delegation uh, in relation to some issue we had with the uh, with the Bougainvilleans and Papua New Guinea to Taro and Choizol. But I remember him as, as, as a young minister, very much sure of, of what he wanted. And I, I think it, it frustrates him no end that he, he, even after all his years in parliament, he's unable to drive uh, um, this whole development um, issue. I mean, he, he comes from a Choizol, pretty remote province, which has so much difficulty with um, uh, infrastructure and transportation, communication, everything that you, you could think of, uh, but then so very close to, to Bougainville and PNG uh, that has much better um, infrastructure and communication uh, facilities. But I think one thing, one thing about uh, uh, Sogovari, I think a lot of Solomon analysts tend to forget. He is only one person in a cabinet. And um, He's the face, he's the face to this government, but he has very powerful movers and shakers behind him uh, who hold together his numbers. And I, I think in all, all the negativity that, uh, negativity that has been um, focused on him, I think we Solomon analysts need to also take a look at the characters behind him and the reasons for the choices being made. I think we, we really need to look at his, his ministers and know, uh, their affiliations and uh, their leanings, and what are the demands on them from their from their voters? And I think I think Sogvare leads a group of uh, people. You're talking the Malaita and the Gurukanal block. 
uh, who have faced uh, a lot of issues in terms of development. The Western Province block uh, is a little different. As you know, the Western Province is um, economically a, a little bit more self-reliant mm -hmm. than if you look on the, uh, the other pro into the other provinces. And I think the Gorakanal and Malita block uh, are the strongholds behind him, including uh, the three members of parliament for Honiara, uh, which um, also has um, positive and negative effects because that's when you have a lot of settlements located here in Honiara. And every single right we have, it's always been as a result of, of um, young people in, in the settlements who were you know, disillusioned with what they thought they could have if they came into town, just like any other developing country. And they left, uh, they left without jobs, without education, and without any uh, much prospect. But like I said, over the last few years too, we've seen that change mindset because of the seasonal workers program. And I think uh, Sogavare, if you look at him as a leader, uh, he's a very well respected leader in his in his own province and his own constituency. That's the reason he's still there. Mm. And as a person, um, like like James said, he's a very intense man. He, he he thinks before he talks. Even that's not very obvious when he speaks in parliament. He tends to get very emotional. I've noticed that about him. He gets very emotional very easily. So I think that but that's how I see him as a leader. Thanks, Dorothy. I mean, James and I in, during the Ramsey celebrations of 2017 saw uh, saw that that emotion in full uh, in full flight. But it was in. It, out of gratefulness for Ramsey. And so it's, I, I don't think we can really, um, you know, a lot of this is theatrics, I think what we see in parliament. So clearly, um, but clearly, you know, he's, as James said, he's a dominant figure in Solomon's politics and the figure we'll have to continue to try to build and maintain this, a relationship with for the foreseeable, foreseeable future. Dorothy, you, you touched on so many issues. I would love to talk more about, you know, I, the riots, I mean, sure the swap may have been a spark, but the underlying drivers are, are the, all the points you raised about youth unemployment, about economic opportunity, about inter-island inter tension, that all these issues are still so prevalent and so important to, to, to talk about in Solomon Islands. But we are, I'm afraid, running close to time. And I do want to come back uh, to James to ask the question of where do we go from here? I mean, how will this change the way Australia engages uh, with Solomon Islands? And you're a very, on a specific point, I mean, it's a hy hypothetical one, like how do you think the next security crisis, if there is one, the next riots, the next time of unrest where you know Australia is where where outside assistance might be needed, should there be one, which I hope there won't be, how will that play out now that this deal has been signed? Uh, that's a really good question, Jonathan. I I I don't know the answer to that. I think um, I do think one of the impacts of this agreement will be um, uh, that trust between the Solomons government and the Australian government will have been damaged, uh, whoever is in power after the Australian election. Um, nevertheless, it does seem that Prime Minister Sogavari was at pains to reassure Australia to say that you remain our, our primary security partner. I, I think if there were to be um, a future security uh, problem that Australia would be called on. But if China is called on at the same time, coordination between those groups could cause a real problem. Uh, that could be a real challenge um, for security planners. Uh, so I guess we need to um, cross our fingers that that situation won't arise. And if and I, I guess could add something to that, um, I, I think Please, one of the underlying concerns is the purpose and the nature of policing in China is very different to um, what it is in Australia. Uh, the police are there to maintain social stability, uh, which is a very different goal to, um, to solving crime. They're, they're, they're pretty rubbish at solving crime. <laughs> you know, they claim to be as safe as Switzerland. I've lived there for a number of years. It's not as safe as Switzerland. The police are uh, universally regarded with um, contempt there because their main thing is to keep a lid on social tensions. Um, and so, you know, if, for example, only they were called on. I mean, would Australia then have to come in and bail out the poor old Chinese police who, who find themselves um, you know, unable to uh, apply their methods or, or finding that their methods actually make things worse on the ground in Solomons? Um, so there's all kinds of interesting hypotheticals there for us. 
Thanks, Graham. Dorothy, any, any last words to add? I'd like, I'd like to give you a small snapshot of what we might face. I mean, just recently in, the, in this right, uh, Australia, of course, led in uh, a very small contingent of um, um, Fijians and Papua New Guineans. And the policing in Papua New Guinea, as you know, uh, is very different to how Solomon Islands uh, police conducts itself. And there were a few <laughs> small you know, spots of trouble in the way they dealt with Solomon Islands. Mm. You saw it in social media, Solomon Islands. This is not Port Moresby, don't come and push us around. Uh, and Solomon Islands, uh, in that regard, are very lucky with our police force, even though we complain about them a lot. Uh, but they're always very respectful of their relationship with the community. Even our rapid response unit gets hammered whenever they, they mishandle a situation. So I, I think um, if we were to get to that stage and if they, was, if they were to bring in uh, Chinese police officers or under whatever arrangement it is, uh, they're gonna have a big PR problem because Somalians are more used to the, the Pacific style, which is Australia, New Zealand, regional assistance mission made sure it left that mark. So whoever's coming after that, really, really needs to know how to handle this society. If not, it'll be an absolute mess. And it would be something that maybe in the end, we'd be asking for Australia to come and clean up again after that, <laughs> Jonathan. Yeah, that, absolutely. There's also a language issue. Like, I mean, in, in the middle of a Malay in Honiara, these, these poor Chinese police whose English is probably not that good, are they even going to understand what's going on? And, and they certainly won't have the language skills to talk things down and to, you know, de-escalate, which is really, as a policeman, your most valuable skill is communication, not, uh, not your uh, riot shield. Well, I think, that's a, I think, Dorothy, that's a very important message to, to leave for, for any external part, uh, power looking to, to um, come into the uh, very complicated domestic context in Solomon Islands. Um, so, you know, I could keep talking with you all about uh, for hours on these issues. And I'm sure we will offline. Uh, and there's, of course, much more to unpack from this story as it develops in the months and years ahead. Um, and so please do keep an eye on low institute analysis as, as the story unfolds. Uh, but in the meantime, thank you to our guests for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for your time. We look forward to seeing you again soon.